traders and merchants passed through Singapore for commerce, but others settled here permanently. Sarafian Saleh is fascinated by their stories. A history enthusiast, his research has focused on the migrant groups that grew significantly following the arrival of the British. As a history enthusiast, the only way for me to look for historical evidence is not below the ground, but above the ground. His search has brought him to Jalan Kubor Cemetery. Untouched by modern development, there are unique relics to be studied here. Jalan Kubor is one of the oldest, most prominent Muslim graves in Singapore. It was the closest to uh, the Sultan's compound. So Jalan Kubor seems to be the best place for me to look for signs of early traders. Records suggest that the last burial in this cemetery took place in the 1960s. But many of the graves date back to the 1800s. What I normally do when I enter a grave, I will look at the ship. So these ships actually allow you to categorize where do they belong to. The grave markings have become faint with age, but Serafian has found a way to read them. I'll chalk on the tombstone. Then I will use a damp cloth and wipe it. So that's one way to reveal the inscriptions. If you're fortunate, if you're lucky, it tells you what date this person was buried. The script is definitely Arabic. Uh, from the typology of the tombstone, it belongs to the Ottoman, descendants of the Turkish Empire. Every headstone is unique to its particular region from where it came from. So for Turkish headstones, they have the head and the stone, and they are of floral motifs. When I first started to explore graves, I got lots of objections from families and friends. They said, why graves are, they are dead, they don't speak to you. But I told them they are totally wrong. The tombstones actually can speak to you via the inscriptions and also the, the shapes. This is a Chinese grave. And what is found here after I've chopped it shows the Chinese characters but I've yet to confirm which clan he belongs to. And when I chop on the other side here, okay, it's actually written in English. You can see the relief here. It's written in alphabets. There is a word affectionate here, and remembrance. Then uh, probably the name of who's buried here, Emma, E-M-M-A. And there is a figure here shows uh, 87. This person died in the year 1887. Exploring the graves has changed the way Serafian looks at Singapore's history. What surprised me when I was in Jalan Kubo, it actually encompasses other ethnic community like the Ottoman, you have Chinese graves there, you have uh, Javanese, Bugis. Kapogla was an established entry port where all the traders of different ethnic, eh, they came here to trade. They got married here and they died here. But the sad thing is, they are forgotten today. Singapore was by no means empty of people during the 15th, 16th centuries. While artifacts from the 17th and 18th century remain elusive, several historical records suggest that Singapore continued to be inhabited. We haven't been able to find anything in Singapore yet for the period of the 17th, 18th century. But we do have a few sources such as this map and it shows Capital Harbor. And it's got the date 1709 and it shows some houses. It suggests very strongly that there were people living on land at that time. I'm sure the Oromong were still living here because Europeans frequently mentioned them when they were anchored around Singapore Harbor or passing through. But then we haven't found any archeological traces of them. Who were these Orang Laut, or Sea People? And what has happened to them since? We know for sure that Sea People actually existed when Raffles arrived. 
So we have been to the graves and I don't see any trace of their tombstones or their existence. So that's the reason why I came to the National Library. The colonial records have classified the world out as scavengers and savages. They don't fit to society. These colonial accounts have long been taken as fact. But other historical evidence actually tells them before the period this world out, they were the marines of yesterday. The question mark is where are they? The seafaring Orang Laut have roamed the Straits of Malacca for centuries. With their formidable knowledge of the seas, some Orang Laut have served as naval protectors of the Malay rulers. Raiding enemy ships and directing trade in their favor. Prowess and skills were greatly valued by the Malay lords. But at the end of the 17th century, their ruler, Sultan Mahmud Shah, was assassinated. Controversy over his successor fragmented the Orang Laut's loyalties. This was the start of the decline in their power in the Malay Kingdom. The Orang Laut belonged to distinct subgroups spread over many territories. Today, many no longer practice the nomadic lifestyle. Serafian's research leads him to an Orang Laut community in Johor, Malaysia. A village named Kampong Sungai Tamon. The Kampong's residents are part of an Orang Laut community that was once based along Singapore's northern coast. Joining Serafian on his research mission is his son, Shaquille. They're meeting the village chief to find out more about his people's history. Saya dapat tahu bahawa orang Selita ni last jom datang ke sini selepas jom tinggalkan Singapura. Saya ada gambar kat sini. Saya tunjuk tempat kalau tempat tinggal kenal lah. Saya sampai mereka tapi ni ni daripada orang Selita ke Singapura. Wah ini sini ni Pak Tua ni. Pak Tua. Saya tu orang orang laut lah. Orang laut. Jadi mengenai keluarga Tok Batin. Ke Tok Batin ni orang Selita dari generasi ke mana? Saya generasi dah dekat sembilan. Jadi masih dulu kat Selita tu sepenuh masa tinggal kat Sekajang kan? Ini rumah. Ini sebenarnya buat pekajang. Dia makan di situ, tidur di situ, beranak pun di situ. Zaman ini mana ada pakai motor. Yalah, pakai dayung. dayung ataupun layar mengkuang ni. Hmm. Layar pekajang ni. Ha, dia ikut arah hangin ke mana pergi. Adakah kehidupan mereka sama dengan dulu? Uh, nak menangkap ikan, ada Ad dia tanaman sendiri kan? Sekarang dah muda. Sekarang dia orang ada ternak ikan sebagainya Dah ada niaga hmm. Nampak perubahan lah di situ Mereka yang muda saya kan Sarafian is then invited to observe a traditional practice The Orang Laut method of spear fishing Berapa lama, berapa tua tradisi Ikan ikan secara memanah Daripada lembing Ini daripada temurun lah Daripada nenek moyang lah Daripada turun temurun lah Sebab ini susah saya dah try <laughs> Kalau kita tak biasa Sebab tu kita kena belajar lah Setiap ha, Kalau dia orang Setiap minggu ataupun setiap hari Belajar Jadi kawan kita ni orang cakap kan Hmm Itulah tengok pada dia nanti Tengok <laughs> Kamu juga tak mau ke ni? 
Saya dapat lihat eh, yang masuk saya bukan saya pakar dalam tangkap ikan Dengan lembing eh. Tak nak sel, sel, uh, selagi pun dapat ikan tu selagi itu pun masuk dalam tak tarik Tak tarik <laughs> saya, saya kagum What I've learned from my visit in Sungai Tomon is that they were allowed They assimilate with the local communities Yet they still practice their own culture They have their own way of life They still maintain their language What they've practiced hundreds of years ago The Oran Laut were some of the original inhabitants in Singapore When Raffles arrived their complex history goes to show that there was much more to what Raffles saw. These are the people that actually existed in Singapore. They have actually played a, a vital role in sculpturing the political landscape of our local waters. I wondered to myself, they still exist 200 years from now. I just hope that this culture will be preserved as time goes by. <laughs>